Well, I like a challenge, that's why I wrote a book, that's why I'm, why I'm here, and my experience is that most of my clients like a challenge, and really that's the inspiration for the work that we do today, is that um, we can do some of our best work when we're challenged, so how do we challenge people effectively, um, courageously, but with, with compassion as well? When I was in corporate life, and you know, I followed quite a typical general management career, and I was very steeped in really what was a command and control style of leadership. So quite a traditional style of leadership where the leader's job was to know everything, to be all powerful, and to tell people what to, to, to do. And if they didn't quite do it the way you wanted to do, you just told them a little bit harder and a little bit more often. Uh, and so I was very much uh, immersed in that, but I knew that it didn't really seem to fit with my own values and my own um, expectations of how I would like to be led. So when I first came across coaching, as I say, when I was coached back in 1996, uh, it was a revelation to me, a complete revelation. So I sat in this room with this lady who was working with me. All she was doing was asking me questions and listening and reflecting back to me. And she didn't seem to have an opinion. And I thought, you know, this is weird. And I remember, I remember at the end of this was a five-day course. And at the end of the first day, my wife, who was here with me in Budapest, I, I rang her up at the end of the first day. I said, I don't know what this is about. I don't get it at all. I think it's a waste of time. I'm thinking about coming home. And I was that far from just leaving this, this, this program, this course, because I just didn't get it. Now, by the Wednesday afternoon, so this was Monday evening, by the Wednesday afternoon, this coaching cycle had gone on and on and on. I had gone deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> and the things that were coming out, the, the, the awareness and the insights, the inspiration that I was getting from that interaction was, was incredible. And quite literally, it turned my, my life upside down. So I came out of that experience having experienced the extreme of non-directive coaching skills. And it was a complete breath of fresh air and absolutely loved it. And so my early exposure to coaching was very much at the extreme of what I call the supportive end of the spectrum. So if we said that people's performance is maximized when there is a balance of support and challenge. I'd come from a world, a corporate world, where it was just challenge, 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 and do it badly, you know, challenge people in a bad way. And when I first came across coaching, non-directive coaching, and I had this burst of empathy, support, non-directive, non-judgmental, asking questions, listening, it was, as I say, an amazing uh, revelation for me. And I really embraced that and adopted that 110%. And if you'd have said to me nine years ago that I was going to challenge the non-directive principle in coaching, I, I would have been shocked because I was really very passionate about that style of coaching. But what I noticed about all of that training, all the books I read, all the, 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 the credentialing examinations that I went to, is that I was really, challenged, I was really being examined around how effective was I as a coach in supporting others, not in challenging others. Uh, and it was great for me to develop these skills because as a manager coming out of corporate life, I needed to develop more skills like that. Um, but it started to strike me a bit, as a, a colleague said at the beginning, that as I coached people, I started to think, hang on, no, there's something, there's something missing here. This, this doesn't seem like the full, the full story. I can do this all day long, but sometimes it didn't quite deliver <coughs> the expectations <coughs> that my clients um, wanted to get out of the coaching work. So I started to, um, with Ian in particular, started to explore this word, uh, this word challenge. And um, as we looked into this word challenge and, and the skills to do with challenge, we, we couldn't really find many books that had been written about that. We couldn't really, in the courses that we'd been on, think of many times that we'd been practicing those skills. And certainly in our examinations with professional organizations, we didn't feel that we'd been tested around our ability to to challenge others effectively. The supporting skills, they're important, they're crucially important, and I don't want anybody today to think that I'm discounting or, or neglecting these skills. And if you worked with me as a coach, you'd notice that I do this 80% of the time. So I don't, I don't want you to think that I'm throwing that away. It's, it's very important. But the 20% of this, of challenge, is really what I want to focus on. 
because I realized in my own coaching, I was making that 20% bit up as I went along. I was just doing what I thought was best. I was following my instinct, my intuition. And at times I'm thinking, I don't think I'm doing this as well as I could do. Um, but part of the reason I'm not doing it as well as I could do is because we as coaches are not talking about that. We're not writing about that. We're not setting up credentials that focus on that. And if we as a coaching community talk about this, practice it, we will get better at doing that 20% of the challenge, which I think can, can really make that bit of extra difference in our coaching presence. Temple of traditional coaching. And, um, you know, we, we, we came across this idea that, that, that as coaching grew up, you know, it, it, it grew up very quickly. And in the early days of coaching, in, certainly in my country, it, it was a little bit amateur and a little bit people sort of deciding that they would do it this way and somebody else would do it that way. And it was all a bit chaotic. Everybody's very excited, but it needed a little bit of structure and a little bit of focus. So I think that's where people started to develop their um, standards, their ethics, their competencies and develop uh, models. But the problem with models, I mean, I said to you, please don't ever think that the facts coaching model is the truth. It's just a model. And the danger with models is, is that we start to think they're the truth and we start to then hold to them and become very ritualistic in our work and we follow a, a, a ritual, a process, and we start to lose our, our human presence and we let go of that to have a, a reliable process. Um, and I think that's a dangerous time. I think we lose the magic of coaching when we, when we give up our presence for the sake of a model. And I realized that in some of my coaching, I was giving up my presence for the sake of a model. And Ian and I said, well, what is the model that we've, we've become slaves to? You know, that we, we, we've stopped thinking, we've become slaves to a certain model. And this is the, the temple that we were worshiping at in those days. And it has three pillars, three sacred pillars. Um, first pillar, the non-directive approach. I absolutely loved the idea of non-directive coaching. But if we become slaves to that and it's all we ever do, there are some risks. So when I first was trained as a coach, it was always about focus on the individual. It's not your agenda, it's their agenda. Follow them wherever they want to go. And then I get into the third coaching session and we'd be so far away in the distance somewhere. And I'd get a little voice in my head going, what on earth has this got to do with the organization that is paying you to do this work right now? And you know, whenever I share this story, people laugh. They sort of nod because we've all been there. <laughs> we've all had that little voice that says, yeah, I know I'm following the agenda, but where are we going to end up if we just carry on doing this? And, and does this really meet the expectations of all the stakeholders who are involved in this, in this work? And building rapport may be the most sacred of all the pillars. So everything that I was exposed to in my early coaching days was about the importance of building rapport. And uh, heaven help you if you ever broke rapport. It was like the, the, the cardinal sin would be to go into a coaching session and and break rapport. But what we're saying is that sometimes your intuition, your heart, your head, whatever screams at you and says, do something different now. Because maybe this is the way that you will help this person in this unique situation to make the next step. So be prepared to break a rule. Be prepared to let go of the temple or the model and be your full authentic self because it's that ultimately that is transformative. If we're in the presence of full, authentic human beings, it's very hard not to be transformed by that. That risk that you will go and, and, and lose track, um, that you have a, a fantastic, interesting conversation, but you wake up a few days later and say, well, did it really lead to anything that's going to make a difference? And that risk, as you say, that uh, sometimes people are just poised to make a change and all they need is a little, a very little push, and then they go into it. So they're hovering, they're hovering, they're hovering, and maybe sometimes it's just a little gentle, compassionate, but nevertheless a push that maybe sometimes we all need and we all value if it's delivered from people we trust. We, we may end up serving the client's ego, and um, 
So I would, uh, I would call that the risk of, of, of collusion. Uh, that particularly with, as you say, senior executives, powerful individuals, confident individuals, persuasive individuals, that you get caught up in their bubble and you start to believe their bubble, but you forget about everybody else's bubble that might exist in that organization or in that team, uh, and you start to collude with an agenda that may be optimizing their own outcomes, but could be generating risks in the wider organization. So Ian and I call this um, shifting from me, me, me coaching to we, we, we coaching. So we, we live maybe in a time where this idea that individual freedom and maximizing of our individual short-term outcomes is, is the most important thing. But we're seeing, I think all the time, increasing evidence that we're reaching a little bit of a limit to that mindset. And starting to take responsibility for the collective outcomes that serve us all in the medium term is maybe becoming a more pressing need. And if we're going to serve that wider collective need, we will need at times to break rapport and to stop colluding with maybe egos that might be just caught up in their own stuff. Now, it's one thing to smash a temple down. You know, it's quite enjoyable because, you know, you get to do all that sort of... Uh, uh, rebellious uh, activity. But once you've smashed the temple, you have to say, oh, well, what are we going to put in its place? Uh, we can't just have chaos. You know, we have to have some uh, structure within to work. So Ian and I, Ian and I built, a, uh, built another temple. Um, we're hoping that somebody will, will as I say, smash it down uh, very shortly. But in the meantime, we have our, our own temple. And we call it the temple of facts coaching. Facts is the model that we'll talk about later. And these are the sacred pillars uh, of of the facts coaching model. Um, so we have five pillars. Now the first three, I think you'd be pretty familiar with as coaches because really we share these with, with, with the traditional coaching mindset. So if I help you just read these rather than strain your necks. So we have, a, we have a pillar here called passionate curiosity. So whether you're supporting people or challenging people, I think passionate curiosity uh, is a crucial principle. There's a quote from, from Einstein, uh, which is, you know, when Einstein said, I have no great skills, uh, I'm just passionately curious. Um, so passionate curiosity as a principle in coaching, I think we will embrace whether we're supporting people or challenging them. This middle pillar, trust in the future potential of all. So there are many people in my career, in my life, who would have not believed in the potential that I had to write a book, for example, um, or, or even to become a coach. Um, but there are some people, thankfully, that I met, either as leaders or as coaches, who, who did believe that in me was more than I thought there was. And that inspired me, that motivated me, and hopefully that's with my clients, whether I'm supporting them or challenging them, I'm always believing <laughs> there is more in them than they have currently revealed. And this third pillar, letting go of status and outcomes. Now, I mean this in terms of the coach. So the coach letting go of their own status and their own need for outcomes from a coaching session. So if in a coaching session I'm worried about whether I'm performing as a great coach and I've got all that sort of interference going on in my head, about, am I doing a great job? Uh, am I going to get more business out of this client? Uh, you know, will they refer me to so-and-so? Uh, will this get me an award at the ICF conference? Um, if, I'm, if I'm worried about all of that, that's going to interfere with my ability to be present and clean for my clients. So letting go of status and outcomes, uh, I would put in there as the third of these pillars that I think we would do whether we're supporting people or, or challenging them. But the two pillars on the outside are the two that I want to focus on a little bit more because I think they're the pillars that are essential if you want to challenge people effectively. So the first one here, build the contract, honor the contract. So in your coaching training, I think you will have come across contracting as a, a practice, as a discipline. If you want to work with people at a more challenging level, that contract needs to be built with more precision and more thoroughness than probably is the case that you are doing right now. 
Um, so for example, we need to be talking specifically with our clients when we meet them about uh, your, the style of coaching that you exhibit and what challenge means to them, what challenge means to you, and do you have per their permission to challenge them as you work through the coaching cycle. And it might be that, you know, I often will show people now when, when I start working with them, I'll show them that first graph about challenge and support. And I'll talk to them about explaining to them why it is that I would like to have permission to challenge them, because I believe it will lead to the best performance and the best growth for them. But as well as having those conversations with the client, I'll have them with the HR manager, I'll have them with the line manager, I'll be looking to identify all the stakeholders that have a vested interest in this coaching assignment because I want the contract to have their voice, their voices in it as well. Because sometimes I might want to challenge on behalf of the line manager. And I know I can only do that if I know what the line manager wants and what their expectation is. Uh, I might talk to some team members because I might need to get out of the bubble of that one individual and into the bubble of the team in order to be able to present the team's voice in the coaching session. So my experience, as I say, with challenging is that the contracting discipline needs to be uh, taken up a level. So I often talk about now the contract as a covenant, not a contract. Uh, I don't know what, how the word covenant trans translates in Hungarian, but in English, covenant is like a solemn promise. So this isn't a professional bit of paper, a contract, this is a solemn promise from me to you. This is a personal thing um, because it's that type of bond that you need if you're going to challenge people effectively. And then the other pillar here, speak your truth, face the facts. So again, in my early training, I was persuaded as a coach that my opinion and my observations my views were not important, that it didn't matter, and I should hold those back. But there'd be times when I'd be in a coaching session, and let's imagine we were all sat in this room, and as an example, we were all looking out of the window, that window there, and say I went to four of you, and you said, see those flowers there? Aren't they a lovely shade of red? And I'm looking at them going, and then somebody else says, yeah, that's they're really nice red flowers, those. Uh, John, what do you think of those red flowers? <coughs> Do I, do, what do I, you know, if I'm following their agenda and if I'm saying, oh, my opinion's not important, it doesn't matter, I go, they're lovely red flowers. And I'm going, I'm wrong, they're not yellow, they're red. It's, must, it, this is, it's my problem. But maybe, maybe sometimes we need someone to say, you know what, they look yellow to me. And maybe we're waiting sometimes, and maybe for our clients, they're waiting for someone to say, hang on a minute, my truth how I see it, not the truth, but my truth is, my truth is they're yellow. It's not the truth, because if I put certain glasses on, they might look red. But my truth right now is they're yellow. Um, and sometimes I was breaking the rapport to be present with our truth can be transformative for our clients. Do we have the courage to be the one occasionally in our coaching work that says, I just don't see it that way. You know, this is, uh, the way I look at it is, is this. Um, and if by doing that, you know, being that voice uh, can sometimes be a catalytic, transformative voice. And the way I look at it now as an independent coach, now some of you are independent coaches, some of you are working in organizations, but particularly as an independent coach, I think if I don't have the courage to say that and be that voice, how could I expect the people inside the organization to do that, who have much more to lose in terms of the political system that they are part of? So when I'm, when I'm coaching as an independent, I see it as a privilege to play that role. And part of the responsibility that comes with that privilege is that sometimes you have to be the voice that says the thing that other people maybe don't want to say, can't say, are worried about saying. Uh, and whenever we do it, it will be scary and risky but I've done it often enough now, it doesn't actually get any easier, but I've done it enough, enough enough to know that uh, I've never had a bad outcome from it. So my worst fears, so the fear that I'm gonna get kicked out of the room uh, by the client has never happened. And the more I do it, the more I think, okay, this is giving me the evidence that suggests that this is a, a role that is important to play as a professional coach. 
That graph that I put up at the beginning with the two axes, the support and the challenge, every approach needs a two by two matrix and we have our two by two by matrix and this is our two by two matrix. Uh, nice and simple, easy to remember. Um, so all we've done on this uh, graph is split the challenge and support into two halves and we create four zones of coaching four places in which we can coach uh, and each of these zones uh, has a role, has a, has a part to play and as coaches we'll find ourselves in different zones at different points depending on the client, depending upon the goal. Low challenge, low support, inertia, apathy, why are we here, I don't care. Uh, I mean occasionally maybe on a Monday morning if you've had a really rough weekend and you meet your client you might be a little bit feeling a little bit of that, you know we're all, we're all human. Um, but hopefully that's not a place we find ourselves often as coaches. But we do find ourselves here. Um, and uh, so high support, low challenge. So in this uh, approach, we're causing that the cozy club. Now being cozy is sometimes nice. Sometimes it's valuable, it's important. We're not saying it's wrong. But if you stay there too long and it becomes too cozy, maybe you lose the edge of that coaching, you lose the uh, ability to continue to deliver the results, the best <coughs> results that you can. This is maybe where I was more as a line manager in corporate life. High challenge, low support. You know, you're telling people what to do, you're telling them even more, you're, you're creating uh, challenging targets um, and all the things that maybe some of us have experienced in, in that style. Um, and we know that that creates Stress can create stress. Uh, and again, as a coach, occasionally I've been in this, um, in this box as a coach. I mean, let me ask you a question. Has anybody had an argument in a coaching session? Isn't it interesting how we never have arguments in coaching sessions, and yet in the rest of our life we have arguments all the time? <laughs> have I, I, have had, I have had arguments in coaching sessions. I remember one session where I was getting up and I was walking the client was, was with and I was just walking and, and pacing up and down the room because I was getting quite agitated. I'd worked with this, this uh, executive for a couple of years. We knew each other very well. And he said, John, I don't think this is working. <laughs> uh, maybe we should stop it now. And so we had this like argument. And I'm thinking, part of me is going, I don't know why. Why are we doing this? This can't be right. It can't possibly be the, the best coaching um, work that I'm doing. But, you know, we go forward an hour, the argument passed, we got to the end of the coaching session, and as we walked out of the coaching session, he said to me, that was really difficult, but I'm glad that we went there. Now, would I do it again? I don't know. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's moments like that that make you think, well, again, what risks are we prepared to take in our coaching, particularly with people where we've built that trust, that relationship? Um, it's amazing how much permission they will give you um, and how much difficult work you can do without breaking the relationship, in my experience. So this is somewhere we might go there occasionally, but this is really the focus for today is how do we get into this high challenge, high support zone? Uh, and a phrase that Ian and I use to describe this is the, is the loving boot. And what, what we mean by that is that every so often we, we need a kick. But it's good if it comes from a person who's actually got your best intentions and the organization's best intentions. They're not kicking you from some egotistical joy of creating sort of pain. They're coming from the right place, but they recognize that sometimes we all need that push, that kick, if we're going to get the best out of uh, ourselves and our our colleagues. It's not about uh, always being here or always being in any part. It's about freedom of movement because each of us will have a preference. You know, our default position, you know, my default position on this graph, I don't know, maybe it's somewhere here. You know, there'll be other people in the room, their default position will be there, others their default will be there. But can we move? Have we got freedom of movement to travel throughout those zones depending upon the needs of the situation? So this is, we'll all have natural preference here, but can we develop as coaches, as experienced coaches, can we develop proficiency and therefore freedom of movement across the whole 
of these different zones. Because if you can be that type of coach for your clients, what a fantastic resource that is for them to engage with. And I remember thinking when I did my coaching skills later that there was a huge overlap between the counseling skills and the coaching skills. And I'm thinking, well, what is the difference then between counseling and coaching? And I came to the conclusion that the difference is not so much in the skills, but in the type of people that we work with. And therefore, uh, the relevance of, and, and legitimacy of challenge. So I typically work with high performing, confident, ambitious senior executives. Now it's a generalization, but most of those people like a challenge because they wouldn't be doing what they're doing if they didn't like a challenge. Somebody going to a, a counselor who's got uh, you know, a sort of um, a health issue or a, or, or a difficulty or an, and, and they, they're working in a different walk of life, maybe a completely different starting point in terms of, of challenge and, and you'd have to be much more careful to, uh, to calibrate that the importance of having that conversation in the contract in com uh, discussion with your clients, talk about challenge, show them this, these sorts of graphs and say, you know, typically as a coach, I work here, but sometimes I work here. The reason I do that is this. How would you feel? How do you feel about that? Is, am I the sort of coach that you want to work with? And really having an open dialogue about challenge, uh, the reason for it, and whether that's what gets the best out of them. I think, I think I had, I've had one occasion where I got to the end of a coaching session <clears throat> and I asked, you know, what could I do differently? You know, what would make this, this better? And I think I have had one uh, session where the feedback was um, that was a little bit too challenging. But I can remember that because it's, it's the only time it, it's happened. I've had a lot, lot more coaching sessions where the feedback at the end be, has been, I love it when you challenge me. Could you challenge me more? So they have this word care frontation, and it's a little bit like the loving boot. In fact, it's maybe a bit better than the loving boot. We, we would have put it in there, I think, if we'd have known about it. So care frontation, I like that. It's that combination of uh, I'm, going to, I, I will, I'm willing to confront you, but I will come from a place of, of care. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning more about using this. And there is a book um, by Peter Hawkins uh, I think it's called Leadership Team Coaching. And Peter writes a lot in that book about working with teams. He works with teams more than I would. And um, I know he's written uh, quite a lot in that book that would be very relevant too. Have you, have you come across that book? No. So Peter Hawkins, I'm pretty sure it's called Leadership Team Coaching, uh, is a good book if you wanted to explore this more in a team setting. So, um, I'm going to just introduce um, a concept now that underpins everything that we do in the facts coaching model that, that is to come. So, this concept for Ian and I is very powerful in terms of just summarizing um, what's necessary for coaches if they want to work in, in, in a more challenging way. And this is a, a term developed by a, a guy called Professor, Professor Cliff Bowman um, from uh, Cranfield University. And he actually developed this from working with teams. And it's called uh, the ZOOD. So Z-O-U-D. <clears throat> and the ZOOD stands for the Zone of Uncomfortable Debate. And so the phrase, you know, that Ian and I use with each other all the time is, you know, when was the last time you entered the ZOOD? Uh, so the zoo, the zone of uncomfortable debate. And what this is all about is that most of the time we spend our lives in the zone of comfortable debate. So in our social interactions, it's very appropriate to be in the zone of comfortable debate. I mean, why would you want to make things uncomfortable? That's not really the purpose of that type of conversation. So in some situations, it's great and fine to be in the zone of comfortable debate. But as coaches if we're not prepared to enter that inner circle, the zone of uncomfortable debate, there's a risk we may not get to the heart of the matter. And since coaching is a conversation with a purpose, with an outcome, uh, then if we're not achieving the outcome that the client wants by staying here, then we should be willing to 
experience the discomfort in order to seek you know, the full resolution, the heart of the matter, or what's sometimes called the elephant in the room. How can I become more comfortable with entering the zone of uncomfortable debate? But the whole point is it's not comfortable. The whole point is this has, this, you will feel uncomfortable. And, and as you do it more often, sometimes it's, you know, it gets a bit easier, but actually it's called that for a reason. And you will be sat there in a coaching session and you will feel, that your insides will be screaming with you to say, please get me out of here because it's uncomfortable. You have to have a good reason for staying there. And the reason for staying there is to get the outcome that the client and the contract uh, has, has decreed. Uh, and then you look back on it and you say, yeah, I'm glad I went there. I know it was uncomfortable, but it was worth it. So bringing this together into a, a model, recognizing that we need to enter the zone of uncomfortable debate, what are the behaviors uh, that will push us into that zone of uncomfortable debate? Here are five cornerstones of challenging coaching. So this is not a model like glow that grow that is sequential, that you apply in a sort of a linear way. It's simply five touch points that you think about in coaching and reach for if you're at a point where you think, actually, I need to do something different. I need to change gear. What can I do? Feedback and accountability, the F and the A. I think they're, they're not, it's not rocket science. We know what feedback is. We know what accountability is. Um, so really, feedback and accountability, it's more about practicing, uh, having tools and techniques, uh, and recognizing that uh, we need to turn the volume up on those skills uh, if we're going to be challenging coaches. In particular, accountability, I like to think about accountability at three levels. So we have that first individual level of, have you done the actions that you took from the last coaching session? That's accountability. We have the accountability to the coach in relationship. So I noticed that every time we start our coaching sessions, we seem to start 10 minutes late. I was wondering what that was all about. So that's accountability between the coach and the coachee. Because often what you experience as a coach is maybe what other people are experiencing also in the presence of that individual. And the third level, accountability. Um, I noticed when you talked about how you are leading your team right now, to me it didn't seem to fit with the values of your organization. So that third level of accountability is that if, if, if your client is working in an organizational context, there is accountability to the mission, values, ethos, structure, goals of that organization. And as a coach, as a challenging coach, you will hold people accountable to all three levels uh, of that accountability. Courageous goals. So we'll do a lot of work on courageous goals this afternoon because it starts with a goal. If you haven't got a courageous goal at the beginning of that coaching assignment, it's unlikely that you'll need to go and do these challenging behaviors uh, to the extent that you, that you will if you've got a goal that is really going to take someone out of their comfort zone to a, a new place and a new uh, level of performance. Tension, um, tension again, I don't know how the word translates in Hungarian, but in, in the UK, tension is often seen as a negative word. It's seen associated with stress and we need to get rid of stress. Um, so tension, in this model, we use tension that it's a dynamic, constructive energy and that if you work with tension you, and you can and calibrate the tension in the room, the tension in the conversation, you can use tension as a constructive energy. It has a destructive element as well, but if we're not consciously working with tension, we're maybe missing an opportunity to maximize the, the outcomes. And finally, the S, uh, systems thinking. So this is back to that, you know, moving from me, 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 to we, 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 that we're always working in a system. And Ian and I use a phrase about being guardians of the system. Are we willing to be guardians of the system as well as holding to the individual's agenda? Uh, and if there's a conflict between the two, where is our loyalty going to lie? 
And as a challenging coach working in an organisational setting, my loyalty ultimately is to the system, not the individual. And I will look to sort of uh, have discussion about that, to contract around that and to highlight where there's potential clash in that situation. So let's talk about tension. And I said earlier that sometimes this is a word that can have a negative connotation in people's minds because we think of tension, we think of stress very quickly and we think stress is bad. But actually if you look at the psychological evidence, the studies over the years, uh, this is a, a graph known as the yerkes dodson law, which was first scientifically verified in 1908 and has been replicated many times since. So the yerkes dodson law says that as tension or anxiety increases, performance will increase up to a maximum. So up to this point where performance peaks and then beyond that, any extra tension performance will diminish. So each of us has a yerkes dodson curve. So when you're working with your clients, they're going to have one of these and there'll be a point at which they do their best work. And it won't be the same point for every person that you work with. So the question we had earlier on about, um, you know, wh which style of coaching works with different people. If you have people, uh, you know, if you're working with someone who has a, a yerkes dodson curve that is, that is shifted to the right, then they're going to be able to take much more challenge before they do their best work. My business partner, my old business partner, was an ex-chief executive, Olympic silver medalist rower and Olympic coach. His skin was about that thick. And he didn't wake up until you were... I felt I was sort of here on my... You know, Dodson, I, I, you know, I'd be blowing a gasket here and he'd be just waking up because he was just built that way that he needed a huge amount of challenge and tension before he really started to perform. Other people, if you tried to work with them here, you know, they would, they would be in tears or they would charge out of the room or they'd get very emotional. So the point of this curve is to recognise that firstly you have your own Jürgen Dodson curve and all of your clients have a curve as well. So you're never working with just one of these, you're always working with at least two of these curves. But also when we're working together, um, we can start to refine this. And the other, the other aspect of this work um, on, on resilience, that if you work at your optimum over a period of time, or you work just beyond your optimum, you will, you will develop more and more resilience so that you can actually mould your yerkes dodson curve over a period of time. So this isn't fixed. You can actually build resilience. And the way you build resilience is by working just past that maximum and then coming back and then working just past it. And over time, that will build, build the muscle, the, the resilience muscle that you need. So you can maybe work in more, uh, with more tension and still maintain your resourcefulness.